Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gorevsky from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you've been following along this month, we've been celebrating amazing women in science, exploration, adventure, and conservation. It's been a ton of fun, and we have a whole nother week of events coming up next week. Before we meet today's uh, guest, Anusha, I'm going to take a minute and share my screen, and we're going to take a look at National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive and get a feel for just where everybody's joining us from today. So just bear with me for a moment while I share my screen. Oops, and I'm just going to grab that microphone I hear there. Let me see if I can. There it is. Got it. All right. Now we're going to share my screen. All right, so you can see me there in Alora, Ontario, uh, in Canada. And as I back out a little bit, we're going to get a feel for where our classrooms are today. So no Canadian classrooms today, but we have classrooms in Pennsylvania. We have a handful of classrooms joining us in Virginia, as well as a classroom in North Carolina. And if we move down, we see Florida, up a little bit to Idaho. And then we have Anusha joining us in Alaska. And if I back out a little bit more, I marked a couple field sites where she's worked in the past. Uh, so Arizona, as well as down in Ecuador. So as I come back from that screen share, I wanna remind any classrooms who are joining us live on YouTube, uh, you can still get in on the action. You can send in some questions via the chat sidebar. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. We'll work some of those in. And any classroom, whether you're on camera with us or on YouTube, take some pictures, share them on Twitter, use the hashtag Explore Classroom, and of course, tag at Nat Geo Education because we love to see classrooms in action. So as I mentioned, our guest for today, Anusha Shankar is joining us. She studies Ecuadorian hummingbirds, Arctic ground squirrels, and African grass rats. She really wants to understand uh, animals that use extreme strategies to survive in different environments. So she's just started an exciting postdoctoral position at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks studying ground squirrels that hibernate for nine months of the year and other human mammals like the African grass rat. So Anusha, it is so awesome to have you joining us live today. Uh, we're excited to learn more about your research and of course, they're gonna fire some questions at you. Sounds good, thank you, Joe. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and see if this works. Uh, Oh, I can just share the application. No, I can't. Oh, no, don't <laughs> that one. That one never works properly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you see? All right, I see me. Okay. Let me go to this. All right. Um, you can see my PowerPoint, right? Okay, I'm hoping it's working. Um, yeah, you're good. We've got you. Okay, awesome. So, uh, I was wondering what to talk to you all about today because uh, I just came to Alaska and I just started um, working on some new animals and I thought it would be exciting to share with you a little bit of all these different things I do. But before I start, I wanna show you what it looks like outside where I am right now. So I'm, I'm at home. amazed that it doesn't just fall off but um so this is very exciting for me because i am uh, from a very tropical place in india as i'll show you and um i'll tell you a little bit about the different places i've lived and the different animals that i've been studying so uh this is where my journey started i was actually born in another city in india but i grew up and spent a lot of my childhood in chennai which is in the southeast of india um, and then this is a picture of me as I was growing up. I was playing with a camera case here. Uh, I was about two or three years old. And I think I was always a curious person. And I think what was really important for me and what I was really lucky um, to have was that my parents encouraged that curiosity. And I hope that your parents encourage your curiosity as well. Um, so this is me with some of my family being outside. Um, I, I didn't know that I would grow up to study the outdoors, but that's what I ended up doing. Um, so and this is me teaching my grandfather how to dance, which is also something I, I love doing now as well, dancing. So 
So I uh, went to New York uh, on the East Coast, close to where a lot of you are, uh, to Stony Brook, which is on Long Island, to do my PhD. And um, I started to study hummingbirds there. So this was about seven years ago. And I met a ton of really amazing people. And I got to work with people from Ecuador, from the US, uh, from Canada, and from Brazil, from the Europe. So I got to really meet people from all these different cultures, which is uh, an awesome thing about doing science. And um, I got to study hummingbirds. So hummingbirds are fascinating little creatures. I'm sure a lot of you um, a lot of you seem to live in places where there are hummingbirds. So you would have seen at least the ruby-throated hummingbird on the east coast of the US. Um, and they're really tiny. They use up a lot of energy really quickly. And to study them, um, I'm really interested in studying how they use energy. But we can't put Fitbits on them. They're too big. Uh, the Fitbits would fall off. And so we have to find other ways of understanding how hummingbirds use energy. So I go to Arizona. I used to go to Arizona uh, in the southeast US, which uh, Joe showed you on the map. Uh, and the landscapes look like this. It's like a desert with uh, with these little red flowers in the front, being what the hummingbirds are feeding on in these landscapes. And I also got to go to Ecuador um, in the mountains. And I just I love being in Ecuador. It's such a beautiful country with such warm people. Um, and I had all these different field sites. Uh, in Ecuador. So one of them was this cloud forest site uh, called Santa Lucia, where we use, uh, we uh, recruit donkeys, uh, mules to help us take our luggage up the mountain. So there's no roads for cars to travel up. Um, and we get to see just beautiful views like this uh, when we wake up every morning. The, the whole valley is just blanketed with these clouds below us. Um, and it's a really amazing place to spend some time. Um, and if you go dive beneath those clouds, you see uh, you can see all of these hummingbirds. So there's at least eight different types or species of hummingbirds in this video, um, and they're just fighting. They're flying. They're trying to feed on this nectar, which has sugar in it, which is their main source of energy to power their flight through the day. Um, so this is just an incredible kind of place to see a lot of different types of animals. Um, and so a lot of that energy, like I was saying, comes from this nectar from sugar water, also from insects. We don't know how much, but um, a lot of hummingbirds energy comes from this nectar and they feed on many different types of plant species. So they're really important for the environment as well, um, because plants and they, they pollinate a lot of plants and they get energy from a lot of plants. And so there's a lot of interactions between hummingbirds and the plants in where they live. And what they do at night is what really, really started fascinating me. Um, you must know of bears that hibernate um, and maybe the squirrels that hibernate as well. Hummingbirds are able to do something similar. They use, they use a strategy called torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R where they shut off basically a lot of what their body does and save a ton of energy by doing it. Um, so it's like during the day, if you imagine that their energy is like a volume panel on a, on a DJ's sound mixing kind of equipment, um, a lot of everything is really high during the day. But at night, they're able to shut off a lot of things. They just push the, the volume controls down, the, the body's processes, they kind of shut them all off. And they just keep a few things running. So they breathe just one or two times a minute. Their heart really slows down. Um, they're not using much energy at all, and their body gets really cold. Um, and by doing this, they're able to survive the night and wake up the next morning without running out of energy. So to study these hummingbirds in these sites, we have one way is to put up these giant nets called mist nets. And the hummingbirds, they're so thin that the hummingbirds could fly into them. Um, and then we are gently able to take them out and study what we want and then let them go again. So this is what it looks like when I'm holding a hummingbird. This is uh, a beautiful purple uh, throated hummingbird. <laughs> so, are we good? So one of the ways that I can study them is by using a thermal camera. So this uh, this camera here that you see, uh, a student Isabel handling is a 
able to record heat. So uh, if you put it on me, you'll see that my face is really warm. My hair isn't so warm. Um, and it's pointed here at a hummingbird, which uh, is in this tiny little chamber over there. Um, and you're able to get uh, images of them that look kind of like this. We, are, we actually take video, and I'll show you this video in a second. So if you look at this video, you'll see that the hummingbird's eye is really hot, and its beak and its tail are much cooler. So the heat in its body is coming. You can see it escaping through its eyes, uh, around its eyes, more than in the rest of its body. Um, so we're going to watch it, watch the eye, and you'll see that it's breathing. It's breathing quite quickly. Um, so this hummingbird is asleep. Its eyes are closed, and it's spending quite a lot of energy at night. It's even doing twitchy, twitchy things. Whereas this one on the right, the video is running right now. Um, and you'll see that its whole body is almost one color. And it's the same color as the outside air. You can barely even see the hummingbird if you don't like look close. Um, and so this bird is in torpor. And its whole body is about 18 degrees Celsius, which is really cold. I don't know how much that is in Fahrenheit. Um, while normally its body is at six on the outside degrees Celsius. So top is really an incredible strategy. They're, they're flying around so fast during the day, but at night, they're just able to shut off um, and save a bunch of energy. And this uh, really, really helps them make it through the next morning. So this is what um, a bird that is at a high body temperature looks like at midnight. And this is another bird, which is a smaller bird at midnight, also at a high body temperature. But later at night, at 2 AM, that um, first bird is still at a high temperature while the second one goes into torpor. And again, you can barely see that hummingbird there in that image um, because it's so cold. Um, and this is at 4 AM, and it's still really cold. The second one is really cold. So they're able to use uh, this, this incredible strategy. Some other fun things that they do. So I, I watch them with these video cameras all night for many nights. Um, and they, they do fun things like they they, it's what's called preening. So they're kind of keeping their feathers straight. Even though this one is asleep, it's doing it in its sleep. Um, they also do really funny twitchy things, um, which I guess I do too in my sleep when I'm having a dream. Um, they also pee. And I've just put this on loop because it's so funny to me. Um, they pee at night as well. And it's nice and warm. You can see that the pee stream is much warmer than the outside air. Um, so. I got to spend about a year living in Ecuador studying how these hummingbirds manage their energy on a daily basis. And topper is one of the most fascinating strategies that they use. Um, so what if you have hummingbirds in your coming to visit your backyard, or if you don't, then you can try to get them to come and visit by planting some native plants. Um, so find out what plants uh, are from your region that you can plant to attract, attract hummingbirds. Um, and if you put up a hummingbird feeder with sugar water in it, try to use one part sugar and four parts water to make up your nectar. Um, and you can boil it, let it cool, and then you can uh, keep feeding the hummingbirds that. And they should come. But don't use any red dye because it ha it's really harmful for them. Um, these dyes might be OK for humans, but we're really big. When you put dye into a feeder and a, a tiny little hummingbird is eating it, all of the bad stuff kind of affects the hummingbird. So, um, don't use red dye. They don't need it. Um, they can use. They can. They'll be attracted to the feeder color, and that's enough. So no red dye, um, and you should clean. Keep your feeder clean because it can get fungus, and that's really bad for the hummingbirds. If they're eating the fungus um, from the feeders and it gets into their body, then they can get really sick and they can die. So make sure to. If you're not going to keep your feeder clean, then you shouldn't have it up. You should take it down. Um, it's really sad when that happens, if hummingbirds are sick. So then maybe you could see, well, you wouldn't see maybe as many as this, um, but you can see a lot of hummingbirds if you put feeders up. OK, so now I'll talk about where I am now. Um, I'm going to, uh, this is what it kind of looks like on some days. I look out, and all I can see is white, um, which is a, a very big difference from uh, being in a tropical rainforest like in Ecuador. Um, so this is where I am now. Um, some of you are all the way down in Florida, and I am all the way on the diagonal end in um, Alaska up here. 
like Joe already showed you. And I'm in a city called Fairbanks um, in the middle of Alaska. Um, and this is what a few of my days look like. This is on my way to work in the morning. Uh, all the trees were completely covered in white a lot of the time. Um, and that's a selfie of me next to a cute little cabin. And what I discovered the other day is that my hair can freeze. So if I'm breathing out and the water gets on my hair, the water in my breath, then um, it can it can freeze when it's like uh, Fahrenheit or minus 20 something degrees Celsius. Um, and what I'm studying here, I'm studying two different types of animals. One of them are these Arctic ground squirrels. And they use the extreme strategy of hibernating for like eight or nine months in a year. Um, uh, so these they are really cute. They're really chubby and they fatten up and then go into hibernation. And then when they come out, they only have two or three months to find a male or a female to mate with, have babies, and then go back into hibernation again. So it's a really intense way for them to live. Um, and they are able to cool their body to below freezing. So water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. And these uh, squirrels are able to go down to minus three degrees Celsius to survive uh, the winter and save a lot of energy by doing that. So this is a little squirrel coming out uh, of, its, of its burrow and trying to find uh, it's going to eventually look for a mate and find food. Um, and this is a squirrel that's hibernating. Um, this is the squirrel in my professor's hands, little, a little hibernating ground squirrel. Um, they eat things like grasses and fruits and seeds and um, they find in the, in the Arctic. Um, and sometimes they can eat each other. If the males are fighting against each other, they could, they could eat each other. So there has been cannibalism uh, observed in these squirrels as well. And another animal that I study are these uh, grass rats. So um, a lot of uh, Americans, 10 million Americans get what's called seasonal affective disorder or SAD. Um, and 10 million Americans, that's humans get it. 9% um, of Alaskan women get it. So a lot of people get really um, depressed in the winter when there's not that much light. So as you go further and further north, like up to where I am now, there's uh, some days where there's absolutely no sunlight. Um, the sun just doesn't come up. Um, or in Fairbanks, uh, it comes up for maybe three or four hours a day. And that can really affect a person's mood. So we're studying how this seasonal affective disorder, which changes with the seasons, um, can affect grass rats. Um, so we test them out with a lot of light or very little light and see how they do. And this can help us understand how it works in humans and maybe find a treatment for this um, disorder. So um, that's just a brief kind of summary of all the places that I, I go and what, um, what I study. But I think what you can do um, and, and learn from is look around you and where you live and find interesting things that are going on because there's no way that there aren't interesting things going on. Like, how does the sun work? Um, I was really amazed when I went from India to New York that the sun stays lower in the sky than it does in India. In India, it goes overhead at, 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 in the middle of the day at noon, whereas in New York, it just stays really low to the horizon. And, and in Fairbanks, um, it stays even lower. So the sun never gets like below that much. Um, and so that's fascinating. Even things like sunlight can change based on where you are. Pay attention to how the sun goes. Um, and look for the plants in your area. You can just go outside for a walk and see how many different types of leaves you can see. Are there leaves with um, multiple small leaf leaflets coming off of a branch, or is it one big leaf? Does the, be does, does the leaf have one um, kind of wiggle, or does it have many of them? Um, there's a lot you can pay attention to uh, just by going on a walk. Pay attention to the animals. How many animals can you see when you go on a walk? There's something called bio blitz, which, some, which your teacher could help you do, uh, where you just go on a walk and write down all of the different types of animals and plants that you see. Do you see a spider? Do you see um, a centipede? Do you see a millipede? Um, there's a lot you can see. And then try to think about maybe like what's going on with the animals that's also going on with me. So when I was uh, studying hummingbirds, I wanted to know how they use their energy and their time. And I started paying attention to how I was using my time. How much time do I spend eating? How much time do I spend walking and exercising? Um, and I can really start to uh, 
kind of relate to what the animals are doing and how they're responding to their environment and also see how I'm responding to my environment. Um, and I think you should just always ask a lot of questions. Um, don't stop questioning the world around you. It's a fascinating place wherever you're living. Um, and there's a lot you can learn by just observing. That's all I have right now. And I would love your questions. All right. Thank you, Anusha. It must be quite a, a change to go from warm places like Arizona and Ecuador for your field work to Fairbanks, Alaska. <laughs> it has been, yeah. And I think I'm really lucky that I get to live in all these different places. But um, there's also so much you can learn wherever you are. Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point, too, about science is when you find something you're passionate about, uh, science can be your gateway to get to explore really cool new places as well. For sure. I never thought that, um, like, I'm never going to earn as much money as a doctor or an engineer, but I think I get to travel so much because I'm a scientist, um, and it's a really exciting way to see the world. All right. Well, let's meet some of our classrooms. So just a reminder, when I do introduce your class, can you just turn your microphone on for me once you hear your class, and then we'll say hi nice and loud uh, for Anusha, and then we'll take uh, your questions. So let's start off, let's start off in Virginia. Let's go to Mrs. Wright's class. And uh, Thomas Jefferson, if you guys wanna turn your microphone on for me, say hi really nice and loud, uh, and then ask Anusha a question. Okay, everybody say hello. Hi! Hi, um, hi Anusha, well, welcome, we're so excited to see you today. Um, we're actually studying trees and how hummingbirds depend on trees. So our questions are going to kind of fall in that area. Uh, one, a couple of questions we had were, how do hummingbirds depend on trees for their survival? And do all hummingbirds um, nest and, and need trees? And then the next question was, um, are there conservation um, things in, in effect to help make sure that the hummingbirds have the habitats they need? Those are great questions. Uh, hummingbirds definitely use trees. Um, usually hummingbirds eat from plants that have sugar, uh, water in their flowers. And um, so these are usually smaller plants. There are plants in the trees that have uh, sugar, water, and nectar as well. Um, but a lot of trees have little insects hidden in their, um, in their branches or in the leaves or in, in spider webs. So hummingbirds are able to get get those insects from from those trees as well but i think the biggest role re trees really play is providing nesting habitat like you were saying for hummingbirds so even um in the field in ecuador there were pine trees um that clearly didn't have flowers for the hummingbirds to feed on but hummingbirds were nesting in those trees so trees definitely play and they can take shelter in trees if they if it's too hot or if it's too cold they can um, hide from the wind maybe in, in trees so trees definitely play a big role in in hummingbirds lives and um, conservation, it really, it really depends on where you are, uh, I think. Um, I don't know if people declare protected areas because of a hummingbird. Um, there are definitely some uh, places with hummingbird sanctuaries. Like I know on Long Island, there was someone uh, who had private land uh, to attract hummingbirds and protect hummingbirds. Um, so I think it really depends on, on where you are. Um, in Arizona, there were so many different species, and there were definitely a lot of state parks where people would go and visit just because of the number of different types of hummingbirds there were. Thank you. All right. Great question to start us off, and really cool that you're studying trees and hummingbirds. Pretty lucky. Uh, let's see. Let us go to Arlington, Virginia this time. Uh, Mrs. Wallach's group is hanging out at McKinley. Let's, if you guys want to turn your microphone on for me and say hi nice and loud for Anusha, and then we'll steal a question. Hi! Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, we have a couple of questions we'd like to ask. So, so. Read, read your question, Colin. So, this one, this one's. Hey. Colin and Ballard, read the question. What okay, this you, one's for Anusha. What, what did, did you study in college and for how many years did you go? That's an excellent question. I studied, uh, for my bachelor's degree, I studied zoology. So I studied a lot of different animals and how the insides of their bodies were organized. 
Um, and then I did my master's degree as well. And I studied ecology and environmental sciences. So I studied these huge birds, complete opposite of hummingbirds. These are called hornbills, H-O-R-N-B-I-L-L-S. And uh, you find hornbills in India and in Africa and Asia and in Africa. And they nest in trees. Um, so they have babies and they hide in little holes in trees and they cover it up. And the female just doesn't come out for like three months because she's taking care of her babies. And she only gets food from the males that come and visit her, from her male, from her mate who comes and visits her and gives her food. So these are crazy um, birds. And that's what I studied in my master's. And I did my bachelor's and my master's and my PhD. It's taken about maybe 11 years. It's taken a long time, um, older than some of the people we have probably have on some of the hangouts. All right. That was a very excellent example of tandem question asking. So very good job coordinating that. Good work. Uh, let's see. So we have a group who is joining us um, in uh, Gran Garnet Valley, Pennsylvania. Some fifth graders with Mrs. Travers. If you want to turn your microphone on and say hi, uh, we'll steal a question from your group. Hi. So I was wondering, um, Anusha, if you ever got sidetracked when you were at some of your research locations and wanted to study other animals there. Oh, all the time. That's an excellent question. Um, I get sidetracked like all the time in life in general, I think. And that's OK. Sometimes you have to say yes to whatever opportunities are, are coming up. Um, I went to the field to study hummingbirds my first summer in my PhD. And I got really interested in photographing all the butterflies there. Um, and so I spent time walking around. And if I didn't see a hummingbird, I was like looking at the floor and photographing a frog or an ant or a humming or a butterfly. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a, a byproduct of being really curious about what's happening around me. I do get sidetracked. All right, but I think that's a really important quality for a scientist is to have that curiosity. Uh, and to allow yourself to take those journeys sometimes. Yeah. All right, cool question. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Cobble's group. They're joining us uh, from Beverly Hills STEM in Concord, North Carolina. So if you want to turn your mic on and fire away with a question, we're ready. Hi. 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 Go ahead and ask the question. Um, We've been learning about how hummingbirds snore, and I want to know what sound does the humming do, hummingbird do when it snores? What sound does a hummingbird do when it snores? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, they don't snore too often. I know that there are videos online, and I've seen it too, um, of them snoring, and it's... <laughs> okay, you want me to make the sound? I'm going to make the sound. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really high pitched. They're really tiny. Become <laughs> a hummingbird snore musician. Um, but they, uh, it's usually when they might be a little bit stressed when they're snoring. So it might not be all that natural. Um, it might be when you disturb them when they're in top and they're trying to get out and they're really like trying to pull air in, but their body hasn't started functioning fully yet. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. All right, well, we'll swing back your way in a moment, but that was, I mean, a lovely impersonation. I've never heard it before, <laughs> but I imagine that's exactly what it sounds like. So that was very cool. Uh, all right, let us visit another classroom. We are gonna go to, where haven't we been yet? Ah, Miss Ivy's group in, <laughs> there they are, hanging out in Virginia. Uh, if you guys are ready, go ahead with the question. All right. We are <laughs> We are very excited and we wanted to share that, I hope you can see this, at Betty Weaver, we are really interested in the United Nations global goals. And we love that the hummingbird fits in with goal number 15. So we have a few questions to go with that. Hold on, here we go. Oh. Let's see. Hi, I'm Ashley Rong and I'm a student at Betty Weaver. My question for you is, what ways do hummingbirds adapt to their environment? And, um, and That's a really complicated question. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, go ahead, finish. Um, we wanted to know, are there any negative effects of a hummingbird going into a state of torpor? I think you guys should do a PhD um, because those are such complicated questions. I started my PhD thinking, I wanna know how um, hummingbirds interact with their environment and what adaptations they have, like with climate change, what are they gonna do? What's gonna happen to them? Um, and it's so complicated that I got sidetracked and I can't answer that question yet because there's so much we have to first find out before we can answer it. Um, but if the plants in the landscapes are changing, hummingbirds do have to adapt um, and feed on them differently and change how they behave uh, to feed differently in the landscape. If the temperatures are different, they have to take shelter and when it's shady um, to like hide from the heat, for example. Um, so definitely what, they goes on, what goes on in their environment can affect them. And it can affect them much quicker than it affects other animals potentially because they're so small and they're on such a tight energy budget that anything that happens to their environment affects them really quickly. Um, but they're also, they also seem really flexible and really adaptable. They can change how much energy they need. Um, and this is one of the main things I found out in my PhD. They can change how much time they use topper for. They can change how much time they spend flying. Um, so they, are, they seem really adaptable to what's going on around them. Um, and the second question was the negative, uh, what was it? The negative consequences of? Of, um, of to tober, tober, is there anything negative? Oh, question? right, okay. I would love to know the answer to that question. Um, hummingbirds are so tiny that it's really hard to like know what goes on inside their bodies. But so far um, with animals that are bigger animals that hibernate, for example, people have found out that maybe they're not as good at fighting um, infections. So their immune system doesn't work as well when they're, in, that doesn't work at all maybe when they, they, it's just kind of shut off when they're in hibernation. Um, they also could get eaten by predators if some, some um, a snake is able to find them when they're in torpor, then they, there's nothing they can do because they're stuck in it for 20 or 30 minutes before their body can warm back up to normal and they can start functioning and flying away. Um, and 20 or 30 minutes is a long time for a snake uh, to eat a hummingbird. It can definitely get that done. So um, immunity, uh, predation, and another potential uh, problem could be that they're not getting all the good benefits of sleep. So we spend about one third of our lives, like. Uh, eight hours a night, that's that's a good amount to sleep. Um, but we don't really know all the good functions of sleep. But when you're in topper, you're not getting all of those good functions. Maybe your brain isn't resting like it is during its uh, during sleep. Um, so there could be a lot of negative consequences, but we don't really know what they are for hummingbirds yet. Maybe you should find out. All right, challenged issued, and I'm sure they're ready to accept it. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, Mrs. Sedilio's group is joining us in San Francisco. Looks like they're a science group. Let's get their microphone. If you want to turn it on for us and say hi, we'd love to steal a question. Okay. Hi. Hi. We're from San Francisco. Super cool. <laughs> Who's got a question for us? Okay, Daniel, go ahead. Go ahead and ask a question. Why are um, hummingbirds um, they are aggressive? And Why also, are yeah. And also, why the hummingbirds go back and forth? Okay. Um, excellent questions. Why are hummingbirds aggressive? Um, not all of them are, but a lot of them are. Um, and they, they, so if they don't eat for like two hours, they could die. And that's a pretty difficult thing to live with, right? You have to get food. And if other animals are trying to get food and you're trying to get food, sometimes you have to fight with them. Um, and also they have to have babies and a lot of animals, um, in a lot of animals, the males have to fight to get the female. So that's another reason they could be fighting. Um, that's why they're so aggressive. And, uh, the second question, oh, I should write these down. What was the second question? Uh, why, do they, why, do they why do they go back and forth? So, um, uh, you ask such good questions, all of you. Um, hummingbirds, so I, I think they have to feed on tiny little flowers that are so delicate that they would fall off if the hummingbird was perching and pulling that kind of branch down. And so they have to be able to um, hover to feed on these delicate little flowers so they don't have to sit while they're eating. And they also respond really quickly. This is linked to the first question. When, when other animals are being, other hummingbirds are being aggressive towards them, they have to get away from them. 
And so people have done these tests where they try to move something really close to the hummingbird really fast. And the hummingbird, they like see which way the hummingbird goes. And they're just like, they're like ninjas. They go upside down, they go backwards. They, they're able to respond so quickly because they can just move in any direction. Um, so I think it helps them respond really fast if there's a, if there's a threat. All right. Well, great question so far. And I just want to, because there's uh, viewers tuning in via YouTube, don't forget that you can send in, let us know who you are, uh, are what your class level is. Uh, we'll watch those questions. But there is a question that's come in online. And this might be a tough one, Anusha, because you've only been in Alaska for a little bit and there's a lot of snow. But uh, this person has heard a lot about some of the national parks uh, in Alaska. And they're wondering if any if there's any standout things from a biodiversity um, avenue i have not explored any of them yet um that is a good question though i know that there's moose and there's elk and there's bears and there's sometimes hummingbirds that come up to some parts of southern alaska in the in the summer um and they're supposed to be just stunning um what i could say without having gone to a national park is that i've gone outside and i've seen the northern lights um just from my backyard um, and I think that's that would be even more incredible if I went to a place like a national park without any light pollution. Um, it's just off. Oh, like you just look up and it was this was happening above me. I could see like these waves of green and purple just dancing through the sky, and it's it's an incredible sight. Sounds good. <laughs> and I hope things thaw out a little bit in the next few months, and you can get into some of those parks and find some of that biodiversity. Definitely. Um, okay, well, let's take a swing back through some of our classrooms because we have some time. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions and everybody's going to wave. So, but we'll give it a try. Does anybody have any more questions? That's okay. That's what I thought. Let's get started. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mrs. Wolf's group, if you want to turn your mic on and fire a question at us, we're ready. Um, we just completed a geo inquiry project on sagebrush, sagebrush and sage grouse were our favorite type of birds and we were wondering what your favorite type of hummingbird is my favorite hummingbird um i love the booted racket tail that has to be one of my favorite i mean i have a lot of favorites and there's over 330 something different species of hummingbirds in the world but these booted racket tails are um really tiny they're about this big and the males look very different from the females and they have little boots. They have little white boots um, like covering their legs and they have these long thin tails with uh, what's called a racket at the end. I don't know if I can really quickly find. If you want, I already got one. Oh yeah. Please. All right, I'm gonna share my screen really quick and we'll show you uh, what it looks like. So there we go. Yes, that's the best photo. All right, perfect. That's the male, and that's one of my favorites. All right, let's stop that screen share and come back. Perfect. All right, great question. Um, let's see. Let's just keep sliding up the list. Mrs. Travers class, go ahead if you have another question. You can turn your mic on for us. Go for it. Are, hum are hummingbirds in danger of, lo of losing their habitat because humans are cutting down trees? I think all animals are. Um, I think it's really hard in the, with so many humans in the world today for any species to live without being in danger. Um, and there's a lot of hummingbirds where there's not that many individuals, and there's a lot of hummingbirds living in places where we don't know too much about them. Um, I think a lot of the Amazon um, and a lot of the tropical rainforests in South America um, could be really threatened in the, in the next few years, especially by a lot of logging companies um, that are making roads through the forest, which really has a lot of impacts very quickly. Um, so yeah, very broadly, I think for sure that there, there are lots of threats to hummingbird habitats. All right, All right. All right. class, if you want to turn your mic on, go ahead. I think it cut through a little bit. I didn't hear which classroom you were, oh, okay. Oh. This is Mrs. Ivy's class. Go ahead and turn yours on. All right. Can you hear us? Yep, we gotcha. All right. Hi, my name's Owen, and I want to know uh, what's the most interesting fact you've learned about hummingbirds? Um, I think talkbird has to be one of the most fascinating things because I 
wasn't really sure why if I wanted to work on birds. Um, I really liked snakes and insects, and I wasn't sure that that I would be excited working with birds. But then I started studying these hummingbirds, and I learned I I collected data on this. Like I watched this happen with some of the equipment that I was using. That they can use just like 10% of the energy that they're using uh, when they're sitting still um, and when they're awake. And the fact that an animal with uh, some of the highest energy consumption rates of all animals with a backbone can also go down to using so little energy, it blew my mind. Um, and so, yeah, I think proper is one of the most fascinating things about them. Very cool. Um, if you want to turn your mic on. Um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to be a scientist? Um, I didn't know that it would involve interacting with people so much. So um, that's one aspect of it that kind of surprised me. Uh, and I like it, actually, I love it. But um, I think the hardest thing for me, which you will have a lot of if you try to be a scientist, is that there's a lot of failure. Um, so there's a lot of things that don't work out like you want them to. Um, I I went to Ecuador and I was deported from there. Uh, they didn't allow me in because of some visa problems that I had. Um, there's a lot of times when we have to do like the the way that people know that you're a good scientist is you have to write these articles um, to find to tell people what you found, and you have to write them for other scientists. But other scientists read it and they test, they, they, they give you their feedback. And very often it's hard. Like they don't think that something you've done is right. They think that you should do something all over again. Um, they say that your paper, your article isn't good enough for their journal. Um, and it really makes you question whether what you're doing is worth it. Um, so failure, actually, it's kind of dark, but failure is one of the things that I have to deal with all the time. And I have to get used to saying, no, I think what I, I'm doing is important and interesting. And I really want to find out how hummingbirds survive or how Arctic ground squirrels survive. Um, and I get to speak to all of you, I think, which is one of the most exciting and kind of energizing aspects of what I do. So um, I balance that. I try to find ways to balance out that failure with with joy like I like I have from talking to all of you. All right. An excellent point is, you know, uh, things don't always work out. But there's two ways of looking at it. You could just give up or you could just keep going. And you can keep pushing, learn from it. And it seems to me like that's what you've got under control. I think it's that's that's super important. Thank you for saying it like that. Because I think in any any field that you choose, whether it's science or not, there's gonna be difficult things. And it doesn't matter what happens to you, you can always whine and complain about it, or you can choose to be excited and use it, use it as an opportunity to learn. And I think you should do that in whatever field you choose. All right, Mrs. Wright's class, if you want to turn your microphone on for us. Hello. Hello again. Um, I want to jump on what you just said because um, a thing we have in our classroom is there is really no right or wrong. Everything is a learning journey. And you come to a new question and you move on. And the outlook is life is a learning journey to be a lifelong learner. So I applaud that. You kind of have that same viewpoint. Thank you for that because sometimes we can be brought down by others, but knowing and believing in ourselves is the most important thing. So my question is um, a couple of things. Is you had mentioned that uh, hummingbirds need plants and bushes? Can you give us specific ones that hummingbirds really like? Um, specific trees that are their favorites and specific plants that are their favorites? Um, where, where where is your school? We are in uh, Falls Church, Virginia. Virginia. Okay, then you should have. Yeah, you should have um, bee balm, um, which is one of the the species that they really love in uh, on the East Coast. Um, they also like. Uh, like I clearly did not have a hummingbird garden when I was in New York. I should have. But um, I didn't have a garden outside. So I, I don't know all of the, the species over there. But in Ecuador, they would feed on what's called palicuria. Um, it's in the coffee family. They also uh, fed on um, this family called Jesneraceae, which is a complicated name. But uh, it gave up a lot of good nectar for the hummingbirds. Um, 
And in uh, Arizona, they would feed on uh, ocotillo, which is like a cactus. It's a really thin, what I showed you in the picture with the little red flowers. Um, so it really depends on the region that you're in. But um, it's it's very easy to find a list of hummingbird plants um, if, you, if you Google it in your region. It's usually an organization which has put it up and it will tell you what to plant. Thank you. All right, if you want to turn your microphone on one more time. Turn around. Hold on. You're too close. Back up. Back up. There you go. How how did you get inspired to study animals? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I always thought that I would be a psychologist or a psychiatrist because I really wanted to understand how humans behaved. Um, but that didn't work out, like another failure in my life. But I decided that I act, actually animal behavior was really interesting. Um, so I went and did some internships. And that's a good way once you get to like high school or college, you can um, find out who's studying the kinds of things that you're interested in. Um, and it's really hard to know if you're interested in something until you do it. So I went out and I, I was in the forest for six weeks in northeast India. Um, and it was really hard. And I like couldn't cook the rice that I was going to eat and couldn't cook the potatoes. I didn't know how to do anything. Um, but I tried it out and I loved it. And so I kept going back to study animals in the wild. Um, I followed snakes, uh, king cobras actually, for a few weeks. Um, and I studied the hornbills. So I just, I tried different things out and I decided I really liked it. All right. Well, this is always the hardest part of the hangout when we're coming towards the end and I know there's more questions. So Anusha, I had shared your Twitter handle with the classrooms in an email beforehand. Are you okay if they fire questions at you later? Of course. I would love it. All right. Perfect. So boys and girls, uh, you can fire some questions. Uh, maybe your teacher can do it for you from the classroom for Anusha and she'll get back to you with some of those via Twitter. Um, Anusha, a huge thank you for hanging out with us today. That was a lot of fun. Um, always cool to see you on a new adventure in Alaska. I hope your hair stays nice and, and thawed out for you for the next little while. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to connect maybe in the spring when you're getting out in the field again. Yeah, I would love to do that and show you some ground squirrels in their natural habitat. Yeah. Thank you all so much. This was wonderful. All and right. Great questions. Keep going. Very cool. <laughs> and girl, if all the people want to turn on the microphones and nice and loud, goodbye and thank you. Uh, so Anusha can hear you all the way up north, and then we will sign off for today. So nice and loud. Thank you so much. Anusha, thank you so much. And then just a reminder to head over to nationalgeographic.org, check the education section, you'll find Explorer Classroom. We have several more events coming up next week that you can check in and tune in with your classrooms. So thanks again, everybody, and we will see you next time.